Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today to uh, Git Makes Me Angry Inside. I hope that you will find this presentation delightful and entertaining, much like I find Git. Um, <laughs> this is, um, it's a fun presentation. It's not um, a strict hour of me talking. There will be activities. Um, you will be, we will be doing things in your chair to help you to learn Git. Um, it's a different a different approach than what we would normally take to teaching software, and I think it's I, I think it's a fun way to do it. So you can let me know at the end in the session evaluations if you agree with that or not. I'm uh, Emma Jane, formerly Hogbin, now Westby, which can be confusing because my books have my old name on it and I go by my new name. Um, I'm a beekeeper uh, up in Canada, which is probably the least relevant piece of information about me that you'll need to know. I work for Drupalize Me, doing mostly project management now, although I've been teaching version control for almost as long as I've been doing Drupal, which is over a decade. So it's, um, I, I've been doing it a while. <laughs> and um, if you're in IRC, obviously not at this very moment, you can ping me, I'm Emma Jane, and on Twitter, Emma Jane HW. Um, I, um, I, I do actually keep bees and, and that is actually me. And I, I do, I've got this tiny little favor. My, my mom is um, back in Canada and it's her birthday today. So if you'd like to play along, if you could send her a quick email and just wish her a happy birthday, I'd be most appreciative. Um, it's Marianne at gingerpress.com. Just, you know, if you wanted to play along and wish her a happy birthday. So we'll get on to the actual um, work part of this presentation now. And I, I want to start out with, a bit of a, a detour before we get to the Git part on adult education. Um, most of us in this room, we often have a few kids who wouldn't fall into the adult education category. So we would be looking at pedagogy instead of andragogy. But ultimately, we're a bunch of adult learners for the most part in the Drupal community. And um, the way we teach things as um, a, a a community of teachers and a community of learners when we set out to figure out all this stuff is not exactly in um, adult education best practices. So when you say to yourself, I've tried to learn this stuff and I just can't do it, it's not making sense to me, typically it's not your fault as the learner. Typically it's the educator's fault for not having presented it in a way that is using best practices as far as adult education goes. And I especially find this around software where you've got specific commands. The, the tendency is to teach the commands and not the concepts or the reasons why behind that software um, and how it applies to your specific work. Um, quick, um, quick show of hands to start here. How many people will raise their hand when asked? Uh, okay, so that just calibrates the room for me, great. And uh, <laughs> how many people here are Linux kernel developers? And I'm seeing about two hands. So for the most part, we are not Linux kernel developers. However, Git as a version control system was written by a kernel developer for kernel development. It doesn't mean that we can't use the tool. It means that there's a lot of things that are built into it, a lot of assumptions that may or may not be relevant to web development and Drupal development. So when you're approaching it, remember this is a, and it's not to say that it's beyond you or out of reach or too smart or too stupid for what you are able to do. It simply is a tool designed by someone who is not working in your space for the most part. I, I did see one or two hands. So um, don't, don't be intimidated by the software, but start thinking of, of yourself as an adult who needs to learn and start perhaps demanding um, some of the adult education best practices that we do see outside of the software industry in terms of how, how adults actually get to learn. And one of the things that I quite enjoy being able to say is that adults learn best when they get to be selfish. <clears throat> so the work, the lessons rather need to apply directly to you and to your experience. You need to be able to see how on the job this is going to benefit you to really be able to internalize that information. Um, perhaps obviously, perhaps not obviously, depending on who your clients are, we are never paid to memorize Git commands. And yet there seems to be this culture of having to memorize everything and hold everything in your brain. What we're going to do today is actually put some of that information out onto paper or in, into your notebook, wherever you want to actually store that information, but get it out of your head and into a place that you can refer to more easily. 
Um, you're not being paid to memorize this stuff. You're being paid to do Drupal development. So let's get back to Drupal development as being the core goal. We need to start with solving or looking at the whole, all of what's happening before we can solve your real problems. And when I talk about the whole, I don't mean what all of the whole or what all of the Git commands are. What I mean is more to do with how we actually approach learning. So typically what we do is we start, when we're learning version control, with simply trying to memorize those commands. And remembering something is, it's only one way to advance your learning. This is um, Bloom's taxonomy that I'm showing you right now, which <laughs> in part I'm showing you the diagram because Drupalers love the word taxonomy. Um, but it is, it's all of those different phases that we go through as a learner. <clears throat> when we get up into the sort of higher level domains of learning, then we start to look at um, applying that information. So it's not just a strict memorization, you know, what's the command to, to do whatever the task is, but how do I apply it and how do I structure my workflow so that the command that I've previously memorized can be applied correctly. And what I would suggest is that for many of us, we're already working at a much higher level when we are thinking about our teammates, but what we don't know is how to connect those Git commands. So as you're going through the exercises, that I've got for you today, think about where, where am I on this scale and give yourself permission to be, um, sometimes at a higher level, you want to think about how to apply this information, you want to think about how to create new workflows, and, and those are more difficult concepts, but more, in some ways more important, they're going to dictate the things that you need to memorize. And if you're relying on someone else for that information, you're not always going to get a great connection between which commands do you need to memorize in order to solve what problems. So we're going to start at the very top of that pyramid today or the top of the triangle today and talk about what are the problems that you're actually trying to solve and therefore what are the git commands that you need to memorize and learn and create a cheat sheet with. So it, again, it's a little bit backwards. Um, what we won't be doing today is we won't be opening up a terminal window. We won't be opening up any specific Git software because you can Google that stuff. Once you understand the problems that you're trying to solve in terms of those workflow dynamics, you can look up the command that you need to run. And I have to say, this one and um, some of my teammates are, are in the room today. So when I need to figure out which branch I'm going to review, in terms of the peer review, I need to ask the server what all of the available branches are. There's four words. I do this on a daily basis. Git, remote, show, and origin. Do you think I can put them in the right order? I get Git first, usually. But there's still this, even though I do it on a daily basis, I still use my reference sheets. And it means that I don't have to memorize things because I trust my reference sheets to hold the information for me. And I use Git as a tool instead of Git treating me like a tool. <laughs> So, as I said, we're not going to be looking at specific applications today. There's too many variations out there. There's too many different little configuration tricks that make that software so unique to us as individual developers that it becomes very difficult to teach them in a generic way. So I'm gonna teach you how to think about it and not what commands to apply. If you're hoping for the specific commands to apply and this is a going to be a disappointment to you, I will not in any way be offended if you get up and leave. I would rather that you are at a session that is useful to you. Again, adults, selfish learners, you're allowed to be selfish and if this isn't meeting your needs, I won't be offended if you need to leave. So, with that in mind, I would say that in the workplace, 90% of the problems that you are dealing with are social. You are dealing with typically a piece of software that was written by a person who was trying to solve someone else's needs and it may or may not have anything to do with the problems that you're actually trying to solve. So when you start thinking about how do I modify the code, how do I work with my coworkers, how do I do all of these things, there's often many best ways to do something and how you resolve that ends up being it ends up being a social problem because we need to decide as individual team members, when I work with my teammate, how, how are we going to do that? And um, it often doesn't really matter, but you need to be consistent and you need to be following the same steps over and over again. So the first thing that we need to do when figuring out our workflow so that we can use Git is we need to figure out who are the people on our team? 
what are their roles within that team, um, and what are the tasks that they complete on, um, on a regular, regular basis. The more that you can document what those tasks are, the more you may realize that you actually have a series of tasks which can be automated. So instead of memorizing 15 commands, it's quite possible that you can have a script which will run those 15 commands and you issue one script instead of doing 15 individual things. But you need to know what those tasks are. You need to have them documented. And as you follow the documentation, you may start to realize, you know, this is the same thing over and over and over again. Is there a better way for us to um, work together or um, automate our workflow? And these are, this is a mishmash of diagrams. This is not meant to make sense. Um, but is there a, a way that we can work together that is even more efficient it's impossible to know if you don't have that documentation and you don't have that conversation on how you should be working. So we'll start out with the first activity. And yes, I am actually going to um, be quiet for bits and pieces of this. So the recording will go, will go quiet for a while while I give you a chance to work on this. So the first thing I want you to do is actually, yes, get out a notebook. And I'm just going to stand here and stare at you for a minute. So we can just stare at each other or you can do it but I want you to write down who is on your code team. May include developers, designers, project managers, QA, but when you think about your coding team, which probably is different from your marketing team, is probably different from your HR team, who is on that team? And you can write down um, names of specific people, or if you're in a very big company, you may want to simply write down roles instead. And I'm going to give you one minute starting now to do this. It shouldn't be that difficult. You should be able to write down the names of the folks that you work with. Okay, so the next piece that we need to add to this is as essentially what are the tasks that each of those people do on a daily basis? Where do you fit in as, as team members? Um, what I'd like you to do at this point is beside each of those people, write down what those folks are actually responsible for. So are they responsible for writing code? Do they review code? Maybe you have a peer review system, so you're both responsible for writing and reviewing code. Do you have one person who is your, um, essentially your technical gatekeeper that only they are responsible for pushing code to the server? Basically, what are those tasks that when you think about them in a Git or a version control context, what are the tasks that you're trying to complete when you're working with Git? I'm only going to give you 30 seconds for this one, in part because this is a, it's going to be a very long list and I just want to get you started. So another 15 seconds, what are the tasks that you work on when you're working with Git? So the next piece, what are the tools that you're working with and what are the constraints or restraints that you've got on your particular project? So in this case, we're starting to piece together the actual workflow uh, diagram. And this is where you know, you'll end up doing a bunch of different versions of this picture if you're actually drawing it out because you'll need to shuffle things around. 
So my tools and restraints, for example, will have version control software. I assume it will be Git. Perhaps it's not actually Git that you are using right now. Maybe you're actually using uh, Subversion or one of the other systems that we could all choose to ignore. <laughs> um, so we'll assume that it's Git that you're using. What's your code hosting system, which could be um, Bitbucket or GitHub or Unfoddle or what other systems do people use to actually store their code in? Not necessarily your ticketing system, but where do you put your code? Just shout it out. Assembla? Is that what I heard? Where else? Anywhere else? Drupal.org. Drupal.org, yep. Okay. Um, and then what's your ser server ecosystem? So do you have a development environment, a staging environment, and a live or production machine? Draw out those boxes. You may also want to write down what the code editors are, um, in part because it may affect uh, how you review the changes between different branches. And then I'm, this is not very common in web development software for uh, client projects, but it is in product software. So when you're working on Drupal the product, you are much more likely to have a testing system of some kind with test bots or test gates. So in your system, if there is a period at which code doesn't get accepted um, before going through some kind of automated test, you'll want to know that as well. As you add things to your page, you're going to see you're going to get to see the complexities instead of having to store it in your head. And the goal, again, is to get this stuff out of your head and onto something that you can actually review. With all of those pieces, we now need to figure out how to shuffle them in a way that we can put them in order. So I said, you know, you'll do several variations of this sheet as you go through it. You've got all of your, your characters or your actors. Now we need to figure out where they fit onto the stage. So the next thing that we need to do is figure out what the workflow is or the, the, the flow, the, the transition of where code goes at each of the different stages. I've got two different variations. In the sort of old way of doing Drupal, we would have one central server. If we were lucky, <laughs> we had something a little bit better than just FTPing the files up to the server. Heaven forbid we were actually editing them live on the server, but you know, web development has changed a lot in the last decade or two. Um, so in a centralized workflow, we've got everyone working on one single machine. This is what we want to get away from, but unfortunately, um, still as of Drupal 7, it's what Drupal almost encourages us to do by storing so much of the configuration information in the database directly. Um, I, we did a workshop on Monday which talked more about using features and Drush and uh, Strongarm and uh, what were the other things we talked about, many other things, um, on how to, to get away from this centralized idea of having things live in a single um, instance. What, what we want to move towards is a more distributed system that has each developer able to do their own work at their own local workstation. As soon as you make that first separation, it becomes cheap or easy to add as many extra steps in there as you like. So as soon as you take yourself down from that um, one central server and give yourself a local workstation, it now becomes really easy to give yourself a development server. It now becomes really easy to give yourself a, um, a QA server. How many people at this point already have some kind of environment set up where they have a local instance, a production instance, and a development server. Hands way up. Is there anyone who's not in this position? Okay, cool. <clears throat> so the next step for a lot of people is going to be taking that human gatekeeper and now making it an automated gatekeeper. How many folks are working with some kind of continuous continuous integration server or some kind of automated something or other. I'm, I'm guessing it'll be about a third. So yeah, cool. So at this point, what I want you to do is take a look at the people and the computers. Don't worry about the git commands that I happen to have up on here, but think about on a daily basis, what are, what are the directions that those arrows go? In general, 
you should be pulling your um, code down from your code repository. You should be pulling your data down from your production machine. We always want to get the, the closest to real data in terms of user-generated content as possible. And then we want to push only the code parts back up to our code repository, which may then trigger, for some of you who've got the automated stuff, once that code is up in the code repository, it may automatically go out to the um, development or production server, depending on what's being used. But just sketch out for me now, and I'll give you a minute or two, and now is a good time to start throwing out questions if you're not quite sure what your diagram should be doing. But go ahead and start drawing those arrows between the people and the machines within your team. So ultimately, this is what you're working on right now. I'll leave up the diagram version of it instead, though, just because it's easier to look at a picture sometimes than to look at words. I'll give you three more minutes to do this. How many people think I actually gave you four minutes too long? Hands up. You, you probably had four machines. You probably had like three, maybe up as many as 10 people on your team. You probably drew about, let's say 10 arrows. How many people had something more complex than that? No one. How many people are checking email? Nice. So let's recalibrate the room. How many people will raise their hand when asked? Okay, good. All right. So now we get to the actual hard part. And the, the nice thing about doing the, um, the sketches this way is that you go from, my God, why is she wasting my time, to something really complex. And what we're going to actually build up now is taking a look at um, how those pieces fit together in a branching strategy. This is probably one of the most um, common workflows that you'll find if you're doing a quick search on the internet. How many people uh, recognize this diagram? For how many people does this diagram look familiar? And then we'll do the opposite. How many people have not seen this diagram before? Again, just recalibrating. 
And for how many people, typically my project managers will go like this. Yeah, that makes sense, that's fine. How many people um, for, for whom, or raise your hand rather, if this diagram is, um, is a comfortable and relaxing place for you to be? <laughs> and are you a project manager? <laughs> yes, no? Developer, Developer. okay, yep. Um, how many project managers do I have in the room? A few? And, and if you turn your head sideways, do you see the timeline? Do you see the Gantt chart? It's kind of like seeing the Rorschach. Do you see it? So what we have is time moving forward, and we have a series of different kinds of branches that are interacting with one another. For most um, sane human beings, this is not a fun diagram to um, understand, even if it gets built up slowly over time. The article does do a really good job of explaining why each of those different lines has come to be. However, in, in most cases, this works for a, a software product and is not necessarily appropriate for a website workflow. So what we um, can do is use it as a reference point, but also drop off a number of pieces which are simply not important to us. And I would say start at the most, start at the beginning. Start with nothing. Don't start with everything and try and implement it, but start at the beginning and then make the decision of how you're going to actually work together and build up. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to add in our team members with our code repository. The team members are going to pull that code down. They're going to probably and hopefully do some kind of peer review and then um, push the code back up into the code repository. Eh, not mandatory, but highly recommended. The next thing we're going to do is add in a public web server. And that public web server is um, where it's, it's where the, the world comes to see what you've built. Now, as soon as you've got developers working separately and a public web server, it's dead cheap and easy to add in that development server. Here we go, development server. So now we've got two servers and times as many local developers as you've got. Now, now we start to get into branches. Where do we actually, or how do we actually divide up our code so that we've got things happening where we want them to happen. So the first thing that we're going to add in here, and this is for those of you who love Git and love your workflows, please choose your names uh, according to whatever suits you best. This happens to be the way that some people do it. So they take their branch called master and they say master is always going to be stable and that's what's going to go on our live website. Some of you are bobbing and some of you just gave me the look of death and dirtiness. So this, this is where things get um, a little bit controversial and a little bit um, like just change the words, keep the colors. So now we've got our master branch that's working and look at where the master branch lives. How many, how many places do you see the master branch in? Put up a show of hands, or a show of fingers, rather. You haven't got that many hands. You'll need to use your fingers. Fascinating. There's threes and fours. I would say that there's four blue widgets on the screen. So for those of you who are seeing threes, are you counting shapes or are you counting colors? Shapes. Count colors. Okay, so, so if, if the code is going to live in, um, in each of those different developer environments, in a code repository, that's another place, that's the circle instead of the strict line, and also on the public server, that branch is going to be, now, those branches live everywhere, but where do they actually get used? Only in some places. So now we've got master. How do we look at the code that's actually being worked on? We're going to need another branch. And that branch, in this case, is going to be called dev. Again, call it whatever you want. Call it Frank if you want. I really don't care. But if you have a naming convention which matches what other developers are doing, it's easier to have a conversation, which is why we have those conventions. But you could call it Magical Pony. If you wanted, you could call it Frank. It doesn't really matter. Git doesn't care. So now, kind of a trick question, kind of going back to what we just did. In how many places does the dev branch currently live? Okay, I'm seeing only fours this time. Good work. <laughs> All right. So again, pretty straightforward stuff. Now, how do we actually work on individual tickets? Now we need more branches again. And the, 
the branches at this point start to get um, a little bit more isolated. So when I work on my individual tickets, I'm going to start on my local machine, and when I'm ready, and this is where the, the diagram, you can only get to so many layers before it starts to get more complicated. So I haven't pushed any of my feature branches back up, but I've got, according to the, um, the NV diagram that I showed you before, I've got two different kinds of branches. I've got features, which are things that I want to be working on, um, and I've got hot fixes. And a hot fix is, oh crap, something broke on the internet and we need to fix it now. Where you branch off of is going to change based on the type of work that you're doing. So now that you've seen that diagram mashed onto the super simple workflow, we can introduce, and unfortunately, I, I don't know that the screen is big enough to see those colors, but the colors correspond to what the diagram had before. So now you can start to think about that diagram, which may or may not have made sense. We took a super trivial people and squares representing computers, drew some arrows, and we've added to it that branching information. I'll come back to the slide that I just showed you, but what I want you to do right now is think about for the different places where the website that you're working on uh, exists and exists in a different state. So your production state is going to be different than the new module that you're currently developing. It, they're, they're, of course they're different. You're doing different things on those machines. So what kinds of branches will you need in each of those different places in order to represent the different states? And I would say, oh, I have to go through this. I hate slide builds. I shouldn't have done this to myself. One more. OK, there. Um, from, from this list of scenarios or branches, how do you typically work? Do you have tickets that you work on? Do you have a live website? Are you working on a product? Um, like if you're working on a public Drupal.org module, you don't really have the concept of a hot fix, really. And you're constantly moving forward, but there's not, there's not a live website that you need to patch up and fix up. You probably have some kind of stable uh, master branch that you may want to put a security fix into but probably you're just going to tuck the extra features you've been working on as well. We are also, um, in terms of time, we're at about the halfway point, and um, it's going to be opened up to huge amounts of Q&A for people to say, okay, cool, I know how this all fits together, but now how do I go about fixing the particular problem that I've got in terms of... Um, uh, what, what's the git command I need to issue at these specific points and when I'm in this scenario. So that, that's what we're going to do for the, the remainder or the bulk of that presentation. Um, but I, I do want you to sketch out, again, what are the, the branches that you want to work with based on um, the situations that you've got. The feature branches and the hotfixes are basically throwaways. You don't keep those over time, but the, um, the dev and the master are branches that are consistent. They stay with us over time. These slides are also already uploaded as a by the way. They're in the comments of the session description. Have you added on, or do you have questions? Does anyone have questions who is playing along about how to add on those branch, branch names for your specific diagram? Nothing specific to that, great. So like I said, the, the bulk of the presentation, I would be delighted to answer specific questions, and we can, we can talk about the commands, but I think that in a lot of ways, we get more value talking about the, the strategy of how we work together and how we, we move that code around. I, we can talk about specific Git commands as well, um, but often there are workflow questions that the command itself doesn't matter. So if you've got 
questions. Um, there's microphones on either side there, but I'm I'm effectively done sort of presenting at you. Um, so if you if you want to go and catch the end of another session, this is the time to do it. I think I've given you enough to start thinking about how you're structuring your workflow. There's a couple of resources in there in terms of uh, branch management strategies. And again, those git commands, once you know the action that you want to accomplish, it becomes much easier to do a search for whatever it is that you're trying to do. Questions? Yep, go ahead. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I must say that uh, early in the piece, I already got a bit confused, probably because uh, I'm conditioned by uh, terms used in maybe all the tools that sure. I get. Yep. Um, so for my benefit, and maybe for some people in yeah, the absolutely. audience as well, um, can you explain the difference between a branch, a fork, and a checkout? Yeah, for because, sure. Because um, yeah, I'm confused about yeah, this Yeah, because, <laughs> for sure. So in terms of the specific terms, when, when we're working with, can you see those, can you see the, is this dark enough that you can actually see what we're looking at? Only just. Only just, okay. So the, the reason why this diagram got um, killed off from the presentation is because it's it's not dark enough to actually read it at the back of the room. So when you're working in Git, you've got a, a series of different actions that you're going to perform. You've got the adopt or download actions, you've got review actions, compare actions, reset, save, and distribute. The checkout branch, and what was the third one that, fork, was that, okay. So the, the concepts that you're working with at that point are all um, take concepts or adopt or download concepts, right? And the, um, the fork is the, the first step, if you're using a forking workflow, where you create your own instance of that project. Typically, we use a, a forking um, workflow. If we want to maintain strict permissions, where only one or a very few number of people can actually commit back into the repository. So we need to separate our copy of what's happening from the original project. And Drupal is a perfect example of that. Dries and the core co-committers are the only ones who can commit back in. So if we want to play around with the code base, we need to create our own copy of it. That's the concept of a fork. Now we tend to work in patches, not in forks, but that's the same separation, the same idea. On GitHub, it's a, a fork as opposed to a patch. There's pull requests instead of patches. So this is where we start getting into more words, but that's your first concept. Fork is taking a copy, all of that information now becomes yours to control. The next piece that we're going to mention is branches. Within that um, main repository, we have a number of different states that the code can exist within. Each of those are referred to as branches. Now, even within the branches, we've got our concept of our working space and the concept of how the code is stored. Our working space isn't we typically work within a branch, but you can be working in a detached head. So the branch is that cluster of um, files in their specific states, and we can check out any of those individual branches and switch um, switch the files, the states that the files are in. Now, I have to, it, it's sort of a weird thing to get it entertained by, but I, I really had the magical moment of version control when I had a, um, What's the word that I'm looking for? Like a, a visual display of a list of files. So not at a command line, but a visual listing of files up. It's like the thumbnails, right, for the individual files. And I did um, uh, get checkouts on different branches and watched as the files appeared and disappeared over in the other side. Because that's effectively what a branch is. is it, it's, I'm in the same directory, nothing has changed. And yet when I switch the branch, some of the fields, uh, some of the files rather appear or disappear depending on what that branch's um, uh, state is, shall we say. Does that help with those individual terms? Yes, it does, I think. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> Can you 
you please tell me the difference between uh, can you can you speak I just can't hear what you're saying I'm sorry uh, can you tell me the difference between uh, feature branch and dev branch what's the difference ah so uh, in a feature branch you're actually working with a specific cluster of code when we're referring to a diff is that what you said diff yeah. we're simply looking at a comparison between two of those different branches so if I want to, again, in, I'm sorry that this isn't dark enough to see, but if I want to be able to compare two branches and see what's changed because I'm reviewing it, I might be looking at a patch file or I may simply be issuing the diff command. So in, in Drupal, we've got that version control option just in terms of the text stuff. A diff in Git is exactly the same concept. It's simply showing me what the difference is between those two branches or so two states of code. So when you are developing in the feature branch, do you merge back to the dev branch or do you merge back to the master? S dev? Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the feature branch, the feature branch is the, the newest amount of code and your workflow is going to change based on what the agreed upon um, steps are for your particular team. I very much prefer merges. My teammate Joe very much prefers rebasing. We can definitely talk more about um, merge versus rebase, but I think that to, I mean, to use... My general question is like, if I'm working on a feature branch, yeah, absolutely. how am I going to go to master branch? So what's the workflow normally? So I've finished with the feature now. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do now? Is it going to be... Do merged? you have a peer review process in place? Yeah. Okay. So, like I've done all that. Okay. What's the process of going production now? So you've got your feature branch yeah. and you want to get it over to, to production. Yeah. Yep. So then from your master branch, yeah. you're going to check out your master branch yeah. and then you'll say merge and whatever the branch name is that you want to pull in. Okay. I still don't clear. It's not clear that what's the difference between dev. Uh, so dev, where, what, I, what do you do in dev then? So development. Fixes. Development is what happens when you're still trying to decide whether or not the code is safe. So if you've already decided that the code is safe, yeah. you can pull directly from your feature into master. Chances are though, you're going to go from feature to dev. You'll do your testing in dev. Yeah. Once you've decided that dev is good and safe and you're ready for a release, you'll yeah. go from dev to master. So dev is basically for testing? Yeah. Okay, cool. That yep. answers my question, thank you. Other questions? I kind of have a follow-up question. Whoops, yeah, for sure. Um, so is dev always an exact copy of master, or how does that Often we have, so it, it depends on how quickly your um, release cycle happens. Um, often teams will have a weekly release cycle, so you'll be working, or, but again, it completely depends, right? So we've got two-week sprints that we work on. So in theory, master will be two weeks out of date from dev. I'm not sure if this, this is a, because this, this whole world is kind of new to me, but yeah. um, it's a lot of talk about code and um, doing development on that side, and that's kind of where I sit. But yeah. it work, working with designers and files and changing, changing on that side, sort of how does that, how do we get designers into that workflow when it's just changing an image, when the image stays the same size? Is it still wise to go through this sort of same work, workflow on that? People first. So you always have to look at who's on your team, and um, at what point are you causing extra overhead for that particular team member to participate? Now, on uh, the Drupalize Me team, our main designer that we had been working with was comfortable enough with version control that he put most of his uh, mocks in terms of HTML and um, CSS. So they mocks, wireframes. I'm, I'm sort of I'm pausing because we weren't working directly from PSDs. We went straight into um, into wireframes. He was comfortable enough that he had his own repository, but he wasn't committing directly to our repository. He did, however, have tickets that he'd open and then updated his own GitHub repo with the, the design changes that we needed to implement. We would then pull his changes into our repository and move forward from there. Now, our new designer doesn't have as much uh, version control experience, so I expect that the workflow will change to a certain degree. And that's where, with your designers, you can, you can decide that it is important to um, take them through the learning curve of working with your particular workflow system, or you can simply assign someone to be doing those check-ins for, for the designer.
other questions? In your uh, in your diagram that had the circle and the rectangles where yep. the people were three or four, mm -hmm. um, so is and the circles were the repository. Now that in your diagram that doesn't live any anywhere, I and mean, that's sort of like a anywhere. Something. Anywhere is such a great question. <laughs> so <laughs> the other things were on physical places. Yeah, the rectangles. They I guess, they all the lived somewhere. Were. the The difference with the circle is that the circle wasn't visible as a Drupal website, let's say it that way. So the, the code repository's job is to store the code, but not to display the website. So anytime I actually want to be able to, um, again, I'm going to assume that we're all referring to Drupal when we're referring to code. So if I want to be able to view my, oh, view is such a loaded word. If I want to be able to look at my website, I need to also have an Apache server, I need to have a MySQL server, I need to have PHP running. But if I just want to store my code, like if I go to drupal.org, I can't see a live instance of any of the particular projects. They're simply hosted on drupal.org. So you need to download the code from somewhere and spin it up inside some kind of web server. So the straight lines were web server boxes and the circle was simply a code repository. Its job was to store things, but not to display or allow um, developers or clients or the public to interact with the content or the website. So everything else would be sort of interacting with the, with the repository. So if I wanted to load something from dev to, to my, my site that's yep. serving, I'd load something up to uh, the repository and then again from the repository to the live site. Each of those, if I, sorry, and I, I'm going to have to go through the build again on this. Is that built up now? I'll come back and explain it for the microphone, but just let me, if I point at things, it'll make it easier for everyone, I think. Yes, thanks. Um, this may be a stupid question. There are no stupid questions, well, only my favorite questions. It's not uh, relative to this. Uh, That's okay. Directly, but you mentioned uh, some other session in which was explained how to uh, um, do f version control on data uh, that is normally in Ah, the yes. So the workshop that we taught on Monday um, talked about some of the challenges of putting Drupal into version control. And in, uh, in Drupal 8, we'll have the configuration management initiative, the CMI stuff going in. But in Drupal 7, we don't have anything very elegant. Um, the slides are posted somewhere for that workshop, I think, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'll give you my card and we can figure that out. But the, the ones that I mentioned were uh, features, Strong arm, Drush, uh, C tools. What am I missing? For those of you who are Git lovers and know what the other stuff is that I'm missing, how else do we get? I'm just I'm blanking on it. How else do we get configuration out of the database and into code? What are the other Drupal modules that we use for that? Is that most of them? Okay. Hey, thanks, Chris. So you can go bug Chris as well, now that he's like answered half of a question. Raise your, raise your arms, come on, there we go. <laughs> go pick on Chris at the end. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. What's the best 
what's the best practice on what's actually in the master and dev copies? Is it the entire installation? Is it the sites folder? Because that's where we Great operate. question. Yeah, what do you actually put into Git is basically. So there are, for every developer out there, there's about three opinions on how to do this. Um, the way that we do it now has changed over time. Um, I, this is, as soon as I say something, I'm, I'm really, I'm like, oh, you guys aren't gonna like what we do, but this is what we do because it works for us. We put everything in, including Drupal core um, and our design files. So from the, uh, from the root repository, we also have doc root, we also have wireframes, we also have documentation, we also have our um, patches, testing, private files, everything exists within that Git repository because it makes it a lot easier for us to spin up an instance of a machine and make sure that everything is in there. Now, um, user-generated files are not version controlled. So if someone uploads a picture of themselves, a new avatar, that isn't stored in Git, but everything else is. Within that structure, Git allows you to do um, nested Git repositories. We don't use Git submodules. Uh, we found that it, for a variety of reasons, we don't use Git submodules. But Git, and this is part of why the Drupal project chose Git, allows you to have one Git repository up here, and then if you want to, you can have another Git repository down here. Depending on who is doing the um, code, the contrib code updates, they may check out a new version with Git, or they may simply do a Drush download. It just depends on, on how, how they're working with that piece. If they need to um, patch, for example, a contrib module, they're more likely to check out a version with Git, and if it's just a straight upgrade, they don't have any patches that they're dealing with, they're more likely to do a Drush download. Is that? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question relating more to commands. Uh -huh. Adding files to Git is very easy. But when you delete the file somewhere in a controlled environment, you do git status, it says you have to remove the file. You try to remove the file, but it's gone already. So how the hell do you get this <laughs> Great question. This happens. happens all the time to me. So just to make sure that I'm understanding the problem correctly, you've, you've intentionally or perhaps unintentionally removed a file, but you got it wrong. What you needed to do was do a git remove on that file. What you can do is reset that file and it will grab a new copy of it. It will bring back the old version. And then once it's brought back, because Git remembers everything, you can then go ahead and do a remove on it. So you always have to do Git RM. And Git RM to remove the file, yep. Okay. But you can bring, if you delete a file and Git's like, hey, I used to know about this file, it's missing now, I don't really know how to deal with it, do a reset on that individual file to bring it back so that you can then use Git RM to actually remove the file. Can, can I've done I it more than once. One real quick? Yeah. You can just git rm it after you've manually rm'd it. You just have to manually type in the path that it used to exist at, and git will toss it out. Yeah. So you, you don't have to re pull it out and then delete it. You can just delete it. So if you use the F flag, F for force, I assume is what that one is then you can go ahead and just use the path that it's telling you in the git status line. Yeah, it can be like miles long, so you can copy and paste. I, I have to admit, I pull it back and then delete it properly. So again, for every developer out there, there's going to be three different opinions on how you can do something, which makes it very difficult to learn because it's too flexible. Question. Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to add to that part. Uh oh, see? If you, if, you <laughs> if you have a lot of such files, it might be just very time consuming uh, git rm each of these. You can just uh, go on and run git add dash u and it will just remove all of them from the index. Brilliant, thank you. This yes, <laughs> so Chris just clarified, so you're using git add to remove and the answer was yes. <laughs> There's been some talk uh, about um, the Drupal.org repository moving to GitHub. Mm -hmm. Can you enlighten us on the pros and cons of that? I'm far too sober. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it, it's a, it, 
we have about five minutes left. I would be delighted for other people to answer that question. Um, and I think they're sitting in the back corner based on the... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's a bigger question than what I have expertise in. So I, I will refrain from having a recorded opinion. Any other questions? We can leave it on that. <laughs> Okay, I don't see any other questions. As I mentioned, the slides are already uploaded, which is my tricky way of getting you to the evaluation page. And please go ahead and fill out the evaluation. Thanks very much for coming today, everyone.